All right, we're continuing our study tonight on Mr. Elijah. I hope everyone has a Bible with them. If you don't have a Bible, check the pew in front of you. And if you can't find one there in that back table in the back corner, you can help yourself to a Bible if you did not bring yours with you. <clears throat> okay, no introduction tonight. We're jumping right in because tonight we get to the main event in the life story of Elijah, which is the famous most famous day where he went up on top of Mount Carmel and he did one of the greatest miracles in the history of all mankind and as we're gonna read this miracle we know how it ends okay we know all the good stuff that happens I, I, I told you guys in the beginning I'm trying my best to read this story as if I'm there and as if I don't know what's gonna happen but I'll be honest with you today's story you can't read it like we're like you can't imagine the scene and what takes place here today and if it really happened in today's day and time like the world would be exploding if what took place then is going to take place now because what happens you have one man go on top of a mountain against 850 not 450 850 bad guys and he takes them all out and he kills them all one guy against the whole country and their 850 representatives and by the end of it he smokes them and executes them and everyone in the country turns back from the bad guy's worship to worshiping the true God from this one guy. The story comes in 1 Kings chapter 18. You like action, you like adventure, you like fire, you like killing, this is your night, okay? No spirituality tonight, just killing, fire, death, action stuff. Now we get to the good stuff in the Bible. Don't anyone, don't anyone ever say the Bible's boring. Okay, the Bible's more exciting than Hollywood. Quick recap, how did we get where we are here tonight? We're going to end up on top of this mountain, this great scene. Chapter 17, verse 1, if you remember, God came to Elijah and said, Go, stand before this Ahab. And he stood before Ahab and he says, There's going to be a drought. And it's not going to end until I say it's going to end. You got that? Ahab is the most wicked of all kings. Elijah steps right up, says, I'm calling the shots around here. I'm saying there's a drought. As soon as that happens, God tells Elijah quickly to run and hide and go to Cherith. Very good. Which means cut down. Okay? Because God wanted to cut Elijah down and humble him a little. He takes him over there. There's a drought. The raven feeds him. He learns to trust in God. He learns the lesson. He's now ready to get promoted. Now that he passed that lesson to Zarephath, which is even a step below Cherith, because Zarephath means someone other than Samantha. <laughs> smelting furnace, okay? Means smelting furnace. So after God broke him, he wanted to crush him, okay? Or the biblical, the spiritual word for crush him is refine him, okay? But it means the same thing, okay? But you can put a positive or negative twist on it. But again, just so in case you weren't here, last week, sounds like our God is pretty angry and pretty mean. Remember, I said God cuts us and refines us in order to use us mightily. Very good. So when God breaks, it's because he wants to use. When God breaks, then crushes, because he wants to use, use mightily used and Elijah would be used more mightily than anyone who's walked the face of the earth so much so that when Christ came remember they said someone coming spirit of Elijah John the Baptist spirit of Elijah so he's gonna use him mightily so that's why he had to break him like that and then he raised the daughter of the widow which was nice but it's nothing compared to what he's about to do here tonight <laughs> okay so Elijah left Ahab many many months and it turns out, we'll find out soon, even years ago, what's Ahab doing? It turns out to be three-year time period between chapter 17, verse 1, and chapter 18, verse 1. What's, we know what Elijah did during those three years. What did Ahab do during those three years? What do you think he did? What did Ahab do? Win wars? Fight battles? What did Ahab do? Ahab woke up every morning and cursed Elijah. 
And he swore every morning he's going to kill that man because that man destroyed his country. Because that man, Elijah, I'm sorry, Ahab, thinks Elijah's the bad guy. And all the people of Israel think Elijah's the bad guy. Because if someone walks into this country, United States of America, goes up to Mr. Obama and says, there's going to be a, fa let's say not famine or drought, because we don't know what that means. The stock market is going to go down until I say it goes back up. And then he rides off into the sunset. We want to kill that man. We want to say there's a man who's sabotaging. There's a man who's doing voodoo, black magic. Someone just comes in and says, the country's economy is going down the toilet. Gas prices are going to go up until I say so. All of us would be trying to kill that man. And that's who uh, Elijah was right now. He just walked in, said, there's going to be a drought. That means animals are going to die. That means people are going to die. That means everything is going to die until I say so. So he's cursing him, and he wants this man dead as soon as possible. It's been three years. So if I'm Ahab, it's been three years. They probably assume Ahab or Elijah died from the drought, maybe. Or maybe Elijah left the country. You're not expecting Elijah's going to roll up and knock on your door. But that's exactly what Elijah does. Chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab. And I will send rain on earth. Just, we got to stop right there. Just to appreciate the suddenness with which God speaks. Suddenly, out of nowhere. First he told him, go run away and hide and Cherith and Zarephath, drought, death. Then God comes knocking one morning and says, go present yourself. The same God who says go, later says come. The same God who says drought, now says rain. And it's important that we realize that when God speaks, sometimes people get confused by this. Did God say to, to, to Elijah to hide or to go? Which one? Both. Like he told him hide in chapter 17, told him go now. We get confused by that. Because sometimes God will come and say go. We'll be like, but God, but I thought you told me to hide. And God, are you contradicting and I don't trust God? Well, no. God wanted you to hide. Then he wanted you to finish hiding and he wanted you to go. See how that works? is that between, for God, A to B is not always a straight line. Sometimes there's some zigzags. Sometimes it's go forward, and then go backward. And then go left, and then go right. That's how God works. It's not that you are outside the will of God. That's how God works. Because what happens, at every stop along the way, you become stronger. And you become wiser. Or you become something. So don't get tripped up when God says, like for example, for example, Go be in a relationship with this boy. Hey, that's great. Then God says, go end the relationship with this boy. Which one is it? I know God told me to be in a, with the boy. Now I know God tell me no boy. Which one's right? Yes, both. God told me to take this job. Yeah, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, he wanted you to take that job. Now he don't want you to take that job. Now he wants you to leave that job. Don't, don't get tripped up with easy things like this. Anyway, he goes to Ahab. So Elijah, verse 2, went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. For the sake of, like, time, and since our focus is really on Elijah, I'm going to skip verse 3 to verse 16. Verse 3 to verse 16 is just a topic about Obadiah, who's one of the servants of Ahab, but nothing really happens with Elijah. So nothing really presents itself there. Elijah is to go to Ahab, and then he, on his way, runs into this Obadiah guy, and we learn about Obadiah. You can read it later. Skip it for now. Verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Here's the most wanted man in the land who just rolls on up to the king's door and rings the doorbell. And Ahab looks outside and he says, Is that you, O troubler, troubler of Israel? The word troubler, like that's an accurate translation, troubler. Anyone's Bible say something different than troubler? All say troubler, right? That's an accurate, but it doesn't fully express what Ahab is trying to say. It's kind of an expression, okay, that some, like he's cursing him. Okay, another way that you can translate that is you snake, or you viper, or you asp. A-S-P. I don't know what an asp is. A-S-P, I said P, okay? <laughs> okay, that's what he called him, okay? 
Basically he's saying, is that you, you dirty snake? You son of a gun, you? You no good? He's like cursing him. You finally showed up after all the mess that you caused. Like Ahab, like he's got fire in his eyes. Like he's ready to fight this guy. Of course, really, whose fault is the famine? Is it Elijah's? It's Ahab's fault. But I think you and I know that sometimes it's easy to be blinded to our own sin and kind of blame the whole wide world except ourselves. That's what Ahab is doing, is blaming that guy, even though all that guy did was tell me what was right, and I chose not to listen to him, and I suffered the consequence that he told me I was going to suffer, but in the end it's his fault for doing it. That's what Ahab is doing right now. There's an important thing that it says there at the end of, at the end of verse 2. It said there was a severe famine. When this thing started, this thing started as a drought. Now it's a famine, a full-fledged famine. And I was reading about, <clears throat> as I was reading and preparing this, the expression or the, the person that was writing the commentary said, you have no idea what a famine or a drought in the Middle East means. You have no idea. Talking about a desert place to begin with, talking about three years of not one drop of water. Three years of not one drop. Before today, it hadn't rained in a while. All my grass is dead. All my grass. It's white like my eyes. All the shrubs, all the stuff, all the stuff died. That's from like a week or two weeks. Can you imagine three years of no water? That means that all the grass has died and all the animals that eat the grass, they've died too. The cows, the livestock, whatever it may be. All the plants, those are all dead. And a lot of people have also died. They estimate in the hundred of thousands of people that died from this severe famine. <clears throat> Picture the scene so you understand the emotions in it. Elijah walking through the city up to Ahab. Dead people, dead animals, smell of death, misery. Everyone is in misery. And he walks right up and he's the guy who everyone thinks caused this. And he goes right up to the king. And like I said, the king expresses his anger at him. But our man Elijah, he doesn't back down. He swings right back, verse 18. He answered, I have not troubled Israel. You and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Saying it's not my fault, it's your fault. Verse 19. Now therefore, he, he lays out like a challenge for him. He said, I'm coming to tell you that it's your fault, not mine, and I'm going to prove it to you. Verse 19. Now therefore, Send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's why I told him to bring the 850. It's not the 450. It's 400 of these, 450 of those. But usually we focus on the 450. Cool thing, Elijah with the king. King, Elijah the Tishbite. Who is speaking with authority here? Who's calling the shots? Elijah. For those who were in Light and Life a couple weeks ago, I talked about how Ahab was kind of a sissy. Okay? And Ahab was kind of a sissy. So Ahab was used to taking orders from Jezebel, and now he's taking orders from Elijah, some no name guy as far as he's concerned. That's Elijah. Steps up, says, boom, this is what we're going to do. Verse 20. So Ahab agrees, okay, takes the order well. He learned well from his wife. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Just so we kind of understand. It broke into two groups. There's two groups now on Mount Carmel. Well, there's three groups. There's Elijah. Who's the second group? The prophets of the bad guys of Baal and Asherah. Who's the third group? Who? Not God. Okay, God is always there, true. But who's the third group? Children of Israel, peanut gallery, the audience. So it's me, it's 450 of the, or 850 of the bad guys, and then all of Israel. How much is all of Israel? Millions. All gathered on this mountain today. 
cool thing about Elijah, he didn't just want to beat down the prophets. He wants to embarrass them in front of other people. I like that. That's a cool spirit. I don't want to just beat you down in private. I want to beat you down in front of the whole nation. Verse 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered not a word. Remember, as I told you guys before, that by this time, Israel was at its worst state ever. All of Israel had pretty much gone after worshiping false gods. Like, in almost like a public sense. Like the government was like endorsing and like everyone was worshiping these bad gods. But what they also did, as we sometimes do, is they didn't want to let go of the worship of the true God. So they kind of mixed and matched them kind of together. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm worshiping these gods, but like, I kind of keep this kind of worship right here, off of this sacrifice, off of that sacrifice. So Elijah steps up and says, Look, you people, be hot, be cold, don't be lukewarm. Step to the left, step to the right, but don't be in the middle right here. How did the people answer? How did the people answer? Didn't say a word. So they clearly didn't get the message. They were like, uh, okay, uh, and they didn't answer a word. <clears throat> now you have Elijah, is where the good part begins. Standing toe to toe, me, 850 of those bad guys. On top of a mountain with the whole world watching. I tried to get, like again, we can't fully picture, but let's just say he was slightly outnumbered. And all of them were hunting him. I know it's a snake, but it's the best picture I could find. Okay, make it like a good snake, okay? Like a, a good peaceful snake, that's Elijah, and those are bad beavers or whatever those are, rats or dogs or whatever those are. Huh? Mongooses, mongoose. This is Elijah, standing there. How would you feel, like right now, how many people's right here? Let's say there's 100 people right here. If we're gonna fight, me against you 100. Just 100 against me. Like, okay, I may be a little bit confident, but when all 100 of you started to come at me, okay, you know, I'm not saying I'd be scared, but you know, I, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I'd start with this side of the room probably before I went to that side of the room. <laughs> but I'm talking about 850. 850, plus all the people think that he's responsible. How do you feel if you're Eliza right now? Like, how do you feel? You got 850 people that are ready to kill you at the drop of a hat, and all these people, they want your blood. Do you remember the scene in Rocky? Rocky IV, where Rocky was against the Russian? Do you remember that scene? Exactly. That's, they want blood. And there's this poor American guy in the ring of Moscow on Christmas Eve. They want his blood. And that's the kind of environment that Elijah went into right now. How do you think Elijah felt? I got an audio clip for you. Okay, see who recognizes this audio clip. This is how Elijah felt. Play that audio clip for Amina right now. Go ahead. Make my day. <laughs> who is that? Let's show how old you guys are right now. Play it again, Amina, one more time. Make it a little louder. Let's go. Show how old you are. Who's this? Go ahead, make my day. Who is it? Glenn Eastwood, who's the character? Dirty Harry, very good. That's going back to the 60s and 70s for you. Okay, but that's what Clint Eastwood would say. He'd stare at the bad guys, he'd stare at the gangsters, he'd say, go ahead, make my day. I think that's how Elijah felt. 850, you punks, one of me? Because Elijah, remember, the God, the lit God who live, living God for whom I stand. Before him, he sees 850 punks, but he also sees God of heaven and God of earth. And he sees hosts of heavenly armies. And he sees all that in whom all those people, God, all those people are as grasshoppers in God's hands. And that's who he sees. And that's why he looks at them in the eye and says, go ahead, make my day. Like, go ahead, make your move, man. I'm ready for you. Elijah's a stud. No entourage. All right, he doesn't need people rolling up with him. Heaven has my back. That's what Elijah would say. Okay, the angels of heaven, they got my back. I'm not scared of you 850 nothings. 
So he calls them up to the plate. Verse 22, challenger. Elijah said to the people, I alone am left prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now he's dealing just with the Baals, not the Asherahs. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, and, but put no fire under it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call in the name of your gods, and I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Elijah comes up with a very straightforward plan. I'm going to build an altar. You build an altar. I'm going to get a bull. You get a bull. And in fact, I'll let you choose my bull. We're both going to build altars of wood. We're going to put bulls on top of them. We're not going to put any fire underneath. You call on your God. I call on my God. And the real God is one will answer with fire. The people, Baal was the God of what? Anyone know? He was like the God of like the land, the sun, the wind, all that kind of stuff. So that's why they're like, this is a great deal. This should be no problem. It's start a fire. Like Baal can do it. A boy scout can do it. Should be no problem for our God. He's the God of this kind of stuff. So the people say, well spoken. Verse 25. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call in the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. Stop right there. They say, no problem for our God. And they start to do their little God dances, the little God prayers, whatever it is. And what happens? You could hear a pin drop. And they did their stuff and they, hey, and whatever. And I think God made it. If the wind was blowing, he said, shh, keep the wind quiet. Every cloud was removed. Sun was shining bright. Dead silence. The audio clip I was trying to get, but I couldn't get it. You remember this one? Anyone? 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 What movie is that from? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Very good. Okay. I was trying to get that audio clip, but I couldn't get it. I ran out of time for the Bible study. But that's, that's what it was. They do their dance. They kind of look up. Anyone? 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 And then they would do their dance, do their dance. And it said from morning till noon. That's about three hours of doing their little dance. And then when the dance didn't work, they started jumping even higher. Elijah, man of God, does what? He laughs at them and he starts talking some trash. Look what man of God does right here. Verse 27. True man of God. And so it was at noon. Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. Elijah just sitting there. I just picture him just sitting there just being like... <laughs> Just cracking up, and he's like, oh, no, 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 uh, Baal, I saw him up there, he was busy, try again, okay? Or he said, um, um, you know, maybe he's uh, meditating, he's in quiet time, knock louder. You know the expression, busy? You know what some commentators believe busy means? Okay, what it busy implies? What does it mean, busy? Yeah, he was in the, uh, the godly men's room, okay? <laughs> the men's room of the gods. He was attending to his needs, is another expression the Bible uses. So he's saying, oh no, I'm sure he's in the bathroom. Give him a couple minutes to finish up, wash his hands, and he'll come down, and I'm sure he'll get you the fire. And he's cracking up. He's totally dogging them, totally cracking up at their expense. Look what they did, verse 28. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom with knives and lances, till blood gushed on them. What happens here? As he's making fun of them and laughing at them, they're like, no, our God will, and they started to cut themselves. And they started doing all kinds of crazy stuff, anything, to get their God to answer. Verse 29. When midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. It is now between 3 and 5 p.m. They've been doing it since 9 a.m. And the grand result of all their kinds of nonsense that they've been doing is... No one paid attention. These prophets were punks, okay? And they got what was coming to them. 
And why was Elijah so angry and bitter at them? Remember back in verse, what was it, verse 2? No, verse 19. Why were these prophets punks? Verse 19. Why? Why were they punks? Why? What were they doing in verse 19? While all the people died of the drought, these guys were sitting at the, the queen's royal table, eating it up and laughing it up and having a grand old time. And now, rightly so, they look like a bunch of buffoons, dancing around like idiots, cutting themselves up like dumb people, and no one paid any attention to them. That's the challenger. Ready for the champ? Let's go to the champ. Verse 30. And Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. What is he saying right there? He prepares his altar, prepares the bull, and he's about to call his God, but he says, No, wait a minute. That's too easy. The trash talking continues. He says, Do what? Pour some water on that bad boy. Let's make it a challenge. It's too easy for me. Verse 34. Then he said, Oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I got a better idea. Do it again a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, no, 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 wait. I insist. Do it a third time. So they poured three times these four big, large buckets of water. They soaked this sucker wet. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Elijah prays. They, six hours, seven hours, dancing, cutting, funny stuff. Elijah steps up, lifts his eyes up, says one prayer. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. When it says Lord, there's two Lords. Okay, there's Lord with all capitals and Lord with just one capital L. Anyone know the difference? You know when it says Lord with one capital L, like capital L, O, R, D, small. What does that mean? Huh? Doesn't mean God. Yeah, it means like my master. Okay, like, like I can say my Lord. Okay, like it's like a title. Okay, my Lord. One L or one capital L. But when it's all three, when all letters are caps, like you see in verse 39, it's all four caps, right? That means like the Lord, okay, that's like Jehovah. That's like God, okay, that's like God up in heaven. So it's saying Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. No more Baal, Jehovah is God. And God not only answered the prayer of Elijah with the fire from heaven, but God also, in this one shot, Turn the hearts of his people back to him, which is really what Elijah wanted. And then verse 40, probably the best part of it right now. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed him there. No one understands what happened in verse 40. How? Okay, even if my God beat your God, how I still took you and I brought you down there and one by one I executed you all, only God knows, but that's dirty, hairy inside of him. That's the go ahead and make my day. That's the Rambo. That's the Hulkster. That's the legend, the hero that's Elijah. I don't know how he did it, but one by one, he took them all out and he executed them right there on the spot. Sad. 
some lessons that we can learn about Elijah from this story. If there's one thing that you take away about Elijah from this story, how would you care? Well, I put it up there for you. If you had to characterize the spirit of Elijah, because remember we talked about like the spirit of Elijah. What's the spirit of Elijah here? Is invincible. Spirit of Elijah is like mighty. Spirit of Elijah is like, I don't care what the odds, bring it. Make my day. How can one walk in this spirit of invincibility as Elijah did? I see three things that we can learn from Elijah as far as walking invincibly and powerfully like Elijah did. We walk invincibly when, number one, we know we're in the will of God. Agree with me that when I know what God wants me to do, I'm confident, I'm bold, I don't care. When I don't know what God wants me to do, I'm hesitant, I'm like confused, I'm like, should I or should I not? I don't care what I'm doing. If I know God is with me, if you tell me God wants me to put my head down and run through that wall. If I know God wants me to do it, I'll do it. The hard part is where there's like the, I'm not sure. Elijah knew this is what God wants. God's going to answer this day. 450, that's nothing. Bring 850. Bring even more. Elijah was prepared to take them all down. Just like David. Goliath needs to go down. I don't care how big he is. God is with me. And I know what God wants me to do. I don't care. The hard part is discerning the will of God. But when you know the will of God, you walk invincibly. Agree with me. You can be jobless, but know you're in the will of God. Versus with a job and be outside the will of God, which would you prefer? You can be in danger in the will of God, or you can be in complete safety in your house outside the will of God. Which would you rather be? There's a principle that I learned. I used to work at Heckinger. Y'all know what Heckinger is? You know what Heckinger is? Okay, the old people know what Heckinger is. Okay, that was my first job. Heckinger was taken over by Home Depot. Okay, Home Depot is what put us out of business. It was, like a, it was a place like that. This is what we learned. Measure twice, cut once. You heard that before? Measure twice, cut once. Same thing with the will of God. Pray, you want to know the will of God. Pray, and before you do, go back and pray again. Like, take two steps at the discerning the will of God, and then you can run like a madman through a brick wall. We kind of like measure half a time, kind of get an idea, and then we run. And then we hit our head on the wall and say, oh, that hurt. And then we go back and we try to measure, say, oh, I shouldn't have. Take more time in the measuring and less time in the cutting. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, means walk cautiously, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Where do you think Elijah became so confident in knowing the will of God? This is an easy one for you. Where? 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 How could he be so confident? Where? Who? Cherith, exactly. Cherith and Zarephath. It all comes back to Cherith and Zarephath where he learned how to rely on God and how to discern that will of God. Number two thing we learn about Elijah, how he could walk so powerfully. We walk invincibly when we flood our lives with earnest prayer. It's amazing to note that Elijah entered this fight with 850 against one and he didn't have a weapon in his hand except one. What was his only weapon? prayer. And he held on to that weapon and he used that weapon. He didn't have a manual or directions like I talked about last week. All he had was prayer. James chapter 5 verse 17, 18 New Testament speaks about Elijah. It says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. <clears throat> and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah's life weapon was prayer. And because he held on to prayer, and the key is prayed earnestly, all right, 
difference between praying and pray earnestly. He held on to that weapon, and that weapon brought rain, shut down rain. That, prayer, that weapon knocked down the prophets, that, pray, that raised the dead. That weapon, when you hold on to that weapon, listen, Elijah didn't read books about prayer. Elijah didn't attend Bible studies about prayer. Elijah didn't attend prayer meetings. Elijah prayed. There's a difference. He didn't talk about prayer, he didn't study prayer, he didn't read books about them or listen to cute sermons about them or even attend meetings where other people, he heard other people pray. Elijah prayed. I started to think to myself, something I asked myself, but you ask yourself, take the last seven days. How many times in the last seven days can you say that you prayed earnestly? 14 days. Like, what are we on now? August 1st? 2nd? 3rd? Okay. Since July 1st to August 1st, how many days can you say that you earnestly pray? I'm not trying to judge you as much as I'm trying to get you to examine why maybe we don't walk in the same invincibility that Elijah walks. You guys ever heard of Hudson Taylor? Do you know who Hudson Taylor is? He's a great missionary to the land of China. His son, his name is Howard, like wrote about his father's life. There's a lot of books about him. And he said the following. He said, the sun never rose on China for 40 years without God finding my father in prayer. You know what that means? The sun never rose on China for 40 years without finding my father in prayer. You go find those great people and you see that prayer, they didn't rely on their experience. They didn't rely on, like I said last week, like a manual. They didn't rely on, they relied, I got a problem, I run to God. I don't know what to do, I run to God. Here's my question for you. Where did Elijah pray in this passage, in chapter 18? Where did he pray in chapter 18? Where? Where? I'll tell you what the answer is not. It's not verse 36 and verse 37. It's not. It is, but that... Do you think verse 36 and verse 37 was the prayer, the only prayer that led to this great miracle? You think so? Like knowing all that we know about God, knowing all we know about Elijah, you think it was verse 36 and verse 37 alone? Where was the prayer? Who's smart? Go back, verse 20 and 21. What does it say? Verse 20, Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Verse 21, and Elijah came to all the people. How long do you think it would have taken to gather all the people of Israel on top of a mountain? You think like Elijah just sent out a text message that day? Said all people be there in the morning? How long do you think it would take to gather a million people, Middle Eastern people, parking lot syndrome and all. How long did it take to gather them? Several, several days. Where was Elijah during those several, several days? The Bible doesn't tell us. But I'll tell you what I think. You know F.B. Meyer? He agrees with me too. I should say I agree with him. But we agree together, okay? He wrote the following. In my opinion, Elijah spent those memorable days of waiting on Carmel itself, sheltering himself in some wild cave at night and by day going carefully over the scene of the approaching conflict. Elijah spent those days, we don't know how long they were, this is just a guess, but I think I'm right, on the mountain itself, because he was ready to execute a plan as soon as they came up there, and those days was filled with prayer. And that's why when they came, he says, bring water. Did you ever think of how they brought so much water when there was a drought going on? Did you think about that one? He said, bring water, bring water, bring water. There was a drought going on. Well, Elijah knew where the river was, where the brook was, and he had it all mapped out. So he spent those days in earnest prayer. You never find a miracle like this. I'm not saying the quantity of prayer is the answer, but you never find it with just a two-word prayer. Okay, something like this. So Elijah, will of God. He knew what God wanted him to do, walk in strength. Two, earnest prayer. And number three, and the most important one, and our best lesson here for today, is Elijah was only after one thing. The story of this man is a story, the story that takes place here 
is how one person could do so much. Well, that one person could do so much because he undeniably, unquestionably, more than anything else in the universe, was passionate and zealous for one thing, and that was the glory of God. Verse 36, he says that very nice prayer where he said, Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant. Elijah didn't care what was going to happen to him. Elijah didn't care what God wanted him to do. Elijah didn't care what becomes of me. Lord, I got one prayer, which is that your name would be respected and glorified and revered. I believe and you believe that you live for God's glory too. I believe that and you believe that. When my name gets disrespected, Versus when God's name gets disrespected. Which one irks me more? Like, someone says something about me, and they must pay. Someone says something about God, it's okay. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Let it go. Someone disrespects me, and they should pay right away. And, they, and I, it's, watch out. Someone disrespects God on the TV, on the movie, or friends. Yeah. We're in the 90, uh, 2000s and 11s. It's modern. Which one do you have more passion about? Your name or God's name? Elijah, like I said, like he couldn't contain himself. Every time someone said, hey, they built another altar to Baal. Dah! Hey, they tore down another altar of God, killed another prophet. Throw something through the wall. Like he couldn't contain himself. How dare they? And God's name and God's glory. And he just wanted to just puke or fight or spit or something he was disgusted by the way people disrespected the name of God us we care that about ourselves about ourselves the glory of me what did you say about Boone Anthony you said that about Boone Anthony how dare you say that come talk to me you said that about me don't you know you should love me and respect me care about ourselves care about God it's easy that's why we don't walk invincibly Elijah, you throw, know God's will, and know that you're in the center. You add earnest prayer, and you throw on top of that a passion and a zeal for God's glory, not your own. And I don't care about myself, that your name, that's why he even said, is that you are God, and I'm just your servant. Let them know that you are God, and I'm your servant. Let the hearts be turned back to you again. You put that up there, you add prayer, you add knowledge of God's will, and you walk like a superstar. This statue is if you go to the real Mount Carmel, there's that statue that's sitting right up there on that mountain. It's a very, very, very famous kind of a statue. And it looks really cool. Elijah, yeah, that's our hero, Elijah. Let's stand for a quick prayer, please. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you for... This, this great example that you put in front of us tonight, Lord. Thank you for the example and lessons you teach us through this man, Elijah. And you even said yourself, Lord, that he's a man with a nature just like ours. And we know, dear Lord, that, that we can walk in that same power and that same strength, that same invincibility. But we need you to help us, Lord. Give us to, to know your will and to discern your will and not to be led astray by our own foolish thoughts and our own, our own feelings and our own, our own stuff that leads us astray. Give us, Lord, to be earnest in our prayer. And give us, Lord, most of all, to really seek your glory. Lord, all of us are saying right now, even though we're weak, Lord, we want your glory. We don't want our own. We don't want to care more about our name than we care about your name. So put inside of us, dear Lord, that same passion, that same zeal for your glory, for your kingdom, and for your name. Bless each and every single person who's standing before you, Lord, and, and pour the spirit of Elijah upon each and every single one of us here tonight. Pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ with the intercessions and prayers of all your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.